A beautiful morning to all those who are seated here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And also to those who are watching us online. Especially we welcome Sister Nalini who is not, although she is physically absent but mentally present. So we praise God for that. And also for the others. So I hope and pray that your week was good and that you have been able to witness the mercy of the Lord. And as we gather here today, we hope, let's pray that we'll be spiritually fed and we'll be able to experience once again the blessing of the Lord. With that said, for our opening song, let us sing song number 489, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, song number 489.
we have the mission spotlight. Good morning and happy Sabbath again. Today's mission spotlight is the title is Remarkable Path to Lebanon. It's written by Katie Lichter Walter. Volunteer teacher Ruan Olivera struggled to listen to the speaker at I Will Go Mission Training event at Middle East University in Beirut, Lebanon, where I have seen that guy before he wondered Ruan had arrived from Brazil to serve as a volunteer teacher at the Adventist Learning Center, which teaches Syrian refugee children in grades 1 to 8. He was listening to university teacher Brian Manley describe the work of tent makers. Seventh-day Adventists who follow Apostle Paul's example of using their profession to work in non-Christian countries. Ruan pulled out his cell phone and began to scroll through years of photos. A mission was in Ruan's blood. Born in Brazil, he had grown up in a family that talked and lived mission. As a high school student, he accompanied his parents to Argentina for an I Will Go mission conference in 2017. His heart was deeply touched as he heard about the need of the Middle East. During his first year of university studies, he accepted an invitation to teach English in non-Christian country in Asia. Soon after he arrived, however, the language school closed. He stayed to study the local language but he was forbidden from mentioning God to anyone. Returning to Brazil for his second year of university, Ruan felt a strong desire to go abroad again. He filled out several applications for openings in the Middle East. The region that had captured in imagination at the 2017 conference in Argentina. God, it's up to you, he prayed, as he sent off the applications on vividfaith.com, the Adventist Church official website for volunteers. I will accept the first response that I get. Seven minutes later, a message popped up on his phone. It was from the Adventist Learning Center in Beirut. Ruan arrived at the school six weeks later. After Asia, he had an appreciation for the religious freedom in Lebanon. I can even tell them I am a Christian, he said. After a year in Lebanon, Ruan intends to finish his studies and become a full-time missionary. His conviction that God has called was reaffirmed when he remembered where he had seen Brian Manley previously. After Manley finished speaking at the conference, Ruan approached him, phone in hand, I know where I have seen you before, he said. Scrolling back five years to show a photo of him and for parent, and his parents with Manly at the conference in Argentina in 2017. It was Manly's presentation about tent makers at the conference that had stirred 
Ruan's heart to serve God in the Middle East. This is very, really close to my heart because one of my daughters is, one, is planning to go to outside US to be a missionary doctor. I hope God will help her in every way that she could. And the second one is, when I was in Oregon, back in my home state, I, we used to have missionaries who had come to India. Um, we used to join together on the 4th of July, and we used to have, ex they used to tell us about their experiences, how they entered our heathen country in 1900s, and how they tried to spread the message to, uh, to our fellow Indians to my ancestors, or to all our ancestors, and to our friends. But really, it helped my children by listening to their stories at a very early age, that when they grow up, they want to be, they want to be a missionary somewhere. So the appeal comes to each one of us, as we read about the mission spotlight about Ryan, we read, we listen, we come to church, we do our best. But let's have the spirit of missionary in our heart to be a missionary in our hometown and in abroad. May God help us and let the Holy Spirit convict us to say, I will go. Amen. Yeah, that uh, was one of the good testimony and uh, beautiful uh, mission spotlight uh, week after week that uh, we could be able to enjoy uh, reminiscing how in a world church you know uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, different stories we're admonished and uh, it is for each one of us more welcome sister Navili our ministers uh, very sorry to hear that your daughter is not well we remember in our prayers so the good Lord will be able to heal her and uh, very soon you know, she could be under his mercy. And uh, today we are in lesson two and uh, it is entitled as God's Grand Christ-Centered Plan. God's Grand Christ-Centered Plan. The Bible text is taken from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. 25 years after becoming the first person to walk on the moon. Who is that person? Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. You know, after 25 long years, uh, he writes a thanking note for the people who designed the space shoe, the extra vehicle mobility unit, EMU. This is one of the unit uh, which designed a special suit for Neil Armstrong to travel to the moon. And he thanked them and said, this suit kept me safe and secure so that I could be able to be back on Earth after visiting the moon. And that is history. Okay, and uh, you know, with that space suit, he was photographed, and uh, that was one of the most photographed in you know, a picture at all times. Anywhere you go, you could see Neil Armstrong with that uh, space suit being there in the moon. Most photographed uh, you know, picture. So Armstrong thanked you know, the gang at the Johnson Space Center for the tough, reliable, and almost uh, cuddly suit that preserved his life, sending them a quarter century's worth of thanks and congratulations. Okay. You know, it simply reminds me that uh, the life of Armstrong was with his people who really believed there was a little defect or something 
know, most probably if his life would have been in a geo party, right? I don't know. Just imagine that people who wanted to go uh, to visit this Titanic set. You know, hmm. yeah, okay, what happened? Just a little, little error, that's all. Just a little error, minutest error. Same thing happened when the Titanic was sank, just a minute error which caused the whole huge ship to sink and thousands of people died. Just a minor error. Have you ever thought about a minor error which took your life completely? Either it might be while driving. Minor error which could take your life and it could put you into geo party. And we have a lot of people who met in an accident. Even I had to met in an accident last year. You know, I think that's nearly three to four months ago. Things to get, no, no, four. Okay. Yeah, five to six months ago, I met in an accident. My car was absolutely jammed. And, and praise God that uh, nothing happened to me. Uh, you know, it was you know, not so good. Just a minor error. I know of uh, some of our... Uh, Brethren who never made a mistake of just simply, you know, backing the car and somebody came and hit straight away. And, uh, you know, the whole body was fractured and uh, he was admitted to the hospital and, uh, you know, his leg was completely, you know, gone. Imbapolis I and Brother Anand, we went and met uh, Brother Madhuchinta. You know, just a minor thing. You know, when I think about all this stuff, how thankful we should be to our God and say with Jesus Christ who saved our life in every angle. Paul begins his letter to the Ephesians with a majestic thank you note. Never forget this one. He gives a very big thank you note. He says, praising God for the blessings that he has poured out. Blessings as essential to the lives and the believers of every individual who could be a part of his ministry. And Paul argues that God has been at work on this essential blessing since before the foundation of this earth. Let us be very much aware and intentional about when God has planned and prepared for you and me the blessings. You know, not now. Before the foundation of this world was being laid. And no wonder he been able to always reinstate this beautiful statement. In the book of Jeremiah, he says, this is before you could be born in your mother's womb, I have known you. He is the one who created in our mother's womb. He knows exactly. What a life. Ah, absolutely, absolutely. And don't you forget, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, he says, this, before the foundation of this world, you see, Paul says, sir, his blessings were absolutely worked out. And praise for God for working through the ages on behalf of believers. He always loves his children and he always wants to make sure that they have been blessed. I was just sharing something, you know, uh, in the morning with the Rana as soon as I landed up here. And I said, I thank God, no complaints for whatsoever. In whatever the merits or demerits or, you know, negatives and positives and things like that, I praise God because... I have a roof on my head and I have a food on my table and uh, you know, everything is taken care of just that way. Which I don't deserve. You see? Every day. And uh, as Neil Armstrong thanks the team which made this space suit, just imagine we saved his life and who could be able to go safe and compact. How much more we should be able to thank God in praising him and glorifying his name from the very beginning before we have been born in our mother's home he has already been planned the blessings poured upon each one of our lives still been able to end our journey on this earth amen okay. and one more thing what neil armstrong also said uh -huh. that when he went to the mm -hmm. moon mm -hmm. he said as he was going up mm -hmm. he said that god is present there Mm -hmm. That means he acknowledged God in his life. Yeah, absolutely, that absolutely. That was the main thing about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, the, yeah, acknowledgement of God and his blessings is much more important in our lives in every angle. 
Uh, let's get into the Sunday pass of the lesson. He saying it is talking about the chosen and accepted in Jesus Christ. Who was Christ? Who was Christ? The Son of God. The Father bestowed his love upon the Son, right? So whenever we being able to talk about Jesus, one thing we able to remember the scene and remember is he is the Son of God. Never forget. And we always been noted many a times uh, stating that because of the sacrifice that he died, uh, he died on the cross of Calvary for the sake of humanity, God or his father, you know, made him to be the heir, sitting at the right side, giving the authority and power and dominion to him. And he was one of the most beloved son. Does it make sense? Can I say that one? Okay. And uh, a thank you note usually includes a description or the gift or gifts received, right? When you talk about a thank you, gift, gifts received. Paul includes this long gift list in the Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. If you have time, please make sure that you read all those gifts bestowed upon each one of us. And as he thanks God for blessing uh, of the gospel. I, I want to ask you this question to everyone who are watching online and people who are here. How many of us are really thankful for the gospel that we receive? The good news that we receive? The good news in Jesus Christ? Me. Amen. Okay. Never underestimate the power of truth. Never underestimate the power of truth. And biblical truth. Spiritual truth. Sent through only Jesus Christ. The very word called Jesus itself is a good news. Because with all power, with all dominion, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords coming down to be as a human to die for you and me itself is something you can't fathom. You see, Paul praises God for the fact that he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual gift. And don't ever forget this one. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Paul reinstates once again. And he says it so beautifully that we praise God for the fact that he has blessed us in Christ. He has not blessed us just that way. He has blessed us in Christ. It makes a difference. You know why? Even the Lord's Prayer. We always do mention whom? In the name of Jesus. Because all power and dominion has been given to him. So if you and I believe in Christ and the blessings is being overflowed in every angle. Why? Why do we need Christ? Can't we able to straight away go to God and ask him everything that he'll be able to give us? Have you ever thought about it? Why do we need Jesus? Apart from Jesus, can we be able to straight away go to God and ask him everything? Will, will, would he not bless us? He would. He would? Are you sure? The question is... If you and I have a direct access to God, why do we need Jesus? Let me put it another way. He's a mediator. Huh? He's a mediator. Can we go to God straight without Jesus? We have to go through Jesus. We have to go through Jesus. That's the way how it is. But can we straight away go to God without Jesus is the question. I don't think so. Absolutely right. Okay, why do you think so? Jesus plays a very important role. Because he's the son of God. He's the son of God, number one. And also he has said, if you have seen me, you have seen my father. Okay, so why should we go through Jesus? It's my question. Because he took humanity for us. Absolutely. He is our brother. He is our friend. More than we can relate ourselves with God, we can relate ourselves with Jesus Christ. Because he relates himself with humanity. And that's one of the reasons that, as I told you, that every power, every dominion, every gift has been given to Jesus Christ. So Jesus can understand us. So we are sinners in one way or the other. And that's one of the reasons God was able to block us from not even being able to communicate with heaven. 
So God made it provision in the Old Testament to have a sheep or a goat as a sacrifice that to him. the mediator, you know, God would be pleased and be able to bless us. And that was pointing out towards whom? The lamb was slain, was foretold. But talking about whom? Jesus Christ. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he came and died for you and me. He stayed with us. He was that part of us. He became not only God with us, but he is a friend of us. He is a brother of us. That makes sense. He is an advocate. He is a mediocre person. So anything we need, okay, let me put it now. A very simple sentence. If I have to go to uh, speak to Joe Biden, the president. Can I be able to stay there with you? No. You see the procedure, how it happens, right? Okay. Most probably you have to, <laughs> most probably right there. Security clearance. Uh, security clearance and all lot of that. First, the approval has to be there, you know. So there is some mediations happening, you know, the, and we have to go through that channel. I'm telling you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I can never straight away go to heaven without Jesus Christ. So that's one of the reasons the book of Acts, the Bible says it very clearly, there's no other name on this earth we have except the name of Jesus that we would be able to want inherit the kingdom of God. So chosen and accepted in Christ because he died on our behalf. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 okay, to 6 it contains the inspiring language about how God's view us in Christ. You know, before the creation of this world, God chose us in Christ and determined that we should stand holy and blameless. Never forget this one. God wants to see us that we are recreated in his image. What is this image? His character has to be imbibed in each one of us. So through God, through Christ, I'm sorry, through Christ, uh, that we had to be made holy and blameless. Why holy and blameless? Why do you think so we have to be made holy and blameless? You have any idea? You and I have to be made holy because if we have to reach that holy place, we have to be holy. If you and I have to be blameless before God, the only way that we can be able to go through is home. Jesus Christ was blameless because in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, the Bible says it very clearly, you know, in his presence, if you want to have to stay or at least face God in his presence, can we do that? Can we face God in his presence? Can we face God in his presence the way how we are today? No. Why? Because we are not, we are mortal we are mortals. Mortal beings. Okay, just take a simple example. Uh, when God wanted to come and visit the children of Israel, what did the children of Israel say? Like no, God. we can't behold his glory. So it is not that I, Moses, as a mediator, you go and speak on our behalf. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned, when the presence of the Lord was there, what happened? Just taking no, 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 they were not able to, you know, just witness. So the nature of God is holy, is so bright that this mortal eyes can't be able to see. And same thing happens when the Lord comes the second time. You see the two groups of people, right? One is righteous and unrighteous. What will the unrighteous do? Looking into the glory of God. Because they are sinful, they were not repented. So what happens? They were not able to behold the glory. So when you talk about the presence of God, in the Old Testament, they were not able to enter into the holies of holies, right? Why? Because the presence of the God, God can never be held by humanity because we are, in nature, we are sinful. With a sinful nature, human beings, you can't approach God straight. And that's the reason there was a veil and there was a mediator. That makes sense? Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I can never behold God just that way because we have to be recreated into the image of God. We have to be holy. We have to be blameless. You know, even the priest, 
Once in a year, while he was been able to go into the holies of holies, he has to cleanse himself for seven days. Sacrificing bulls for himself so that not even an iota of sin has to be there in his heart because when he enters into the most holy place, in case if there was one sin with him, what would have happened? In the presence of the God, he would have been dead. That's it. So what was the means of method? Once he died, the There's bell the used to stop and they used to simply pull and nobody would be able to. So that is God. That is God. So that's one of the reasons God wants to recreate us in his image. What is recreating in his image? To be holy and blameless. But are we holy and blameless? Is the question. That makes sense? No. Then how can we be able to inherit? And that's one of the reasons God made a provision in the Old Testament as a lamb, in the New Testament as Jesus Christ, through him that we have. And that's one of the reasons Jesus says, I am the door. Does that make sense? What did he say? That I am the door only through me that you can be able to what? Enter. And Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we have Jesus Christ as the treasured son. Okay, from God. So you and I should be the treasure sons and daughters by virtue of both creation and the redemption in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. The Bible says, since before the sun began to shine, it has been his strategy that we would be accepted in the beloved. That is Jesus Christ. In short, it's God's intention for us to be saved. We lose salvation only by our own sinful choices. Yeah. If you are lost, it is only by our own sinful choices. Arrogance, I would call it. Arrogancy, hypocrisy, or whatever you want to call it as. If you lose heaven, it is not God, it is who? We. Why? God had made all the provision from the beginning of the earth. So that we could be saved, we could be holy, we could be blameless, and uh, and uh, there was a, a mediator be provided, an advocate be provided for you and me, that we could be able to go through him. And if we reject everything, it is we lose heaven or salvation, not because God never provided the means and methods, but we didn't want to go there. That makes sense. Jesus plays a very pivotal role. Yes. So in Ephesians. The phrase in the heavenly places and in the heavens or in heaven's point to heaven as the dwelling place of God. That's the place of God. So, I don't want you to be a part of, of course, be a part of this earth. There's no option. You have to be there. There's no option. But if you and I are supposed to be the sojourners to heaven, the place where, yes. why do you think so we have to belong to heaven? Why do you think so we have to go to heaven? Do you have any idea? Why do we have to go to heaven? Why should we go to heaven? That is our eternal objective. That is our eternal objective. Why do you think so? Uh, that eternal objective, the so-called as eternal objective has to be there. Why do you think so? You know, the world is going to be destroyed. Why? This world is occupied by whom now? Hmm. Sin, Satan, he claims that this world is his, even though rightfully this belongs to whom? God, he is the one who created. Okay, so this adversary called devil, he has been able, so God wants to put an end to this one. And that's one of the reasons, he says, where I am, I want you to be there too. That's what Jesus said, right? My dwelling place is where? Heaven. So I want you to be where? The same place where I'm there. Okay, so where is my father's house? In heaven. So where I belong? In heaven. In heaven. So it means I'm supposed to be his child. So rightfully, I can never be his child because I'm sinful. Okay, so provision has been made so you and I could be able to travel to that place. That makes sense? Listen to this one. Though the heavenly places have become a place of blessing for believers, they are still the location 
of conflict from evil powers and contest the lordship in quest. It simply says that we are in a conflict between whom? Good and evil. So we have to win over evil. So God has made a provision through Christ. Heaven is a place for believers and every individual who will be able to be accepting Jesus as a personal savior. So Jesus is a chosen by God. So if you and I accept Jesus, we are chosen and accepted in Christ. That makes sense? Any questions? Anything you want to contribute? And that's the beautiful thing that we can never have the merit of blamelessness and holiness without Jesus Christ in our lives. Make sense? Any questions? Okay, so let's move on. Okay, to the Monday's portion. Costly redemption and lavish forgiveness. You know, it is self-explanatory. When you talk about costly redemption, Paul is talking about in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. You know, sin had been a dark, dominating force in the lives of the members of Paul's audience. That is, the church of Ephesians. Okay, Paul can describe them into a prior existence as the walking dead. Okay, go back to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. The Bible says, uh, Paul is addressing Ephesians, the church of Ephesians. You remember, when we talk about Ephesians, what should we be able to remember? One, day, one important thing that we have to remember when you talk about Ephesians. Okay, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you talk about Ephesians? Last week we discussed this. Any idea? The seven wonders of the ancient world. What was that? The Temple of Diana. Temple of Diana. What is the other name for the uh, Temple of Diana? Artemis. Artemis, absolutely. Who was Artemis? Basically, an idol been worshipped by the whole Ephesians. Right? So which means they never had the gospel. They never had the good news. Or they never had Jesus. That makes sense? Okay, when Paul goes there, and then he introduces whom? Jesus. Gospel. Which means he introduces Jesus then. So once the introduction of Jesus was being made, what happens? The whole majority of the whole Ephesians, they never wanted to accept Jesus. But there were a few people who were very prominent in the temple of Diana, accepted Jesus to be their personal savior by accepting that's the reason I told you last week. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good is free to them. Honey, so it means these people tasted Jesus Christ eh, and they became a part of the gospel or being a part of Jesus Christ. And then, once upon a time, they never knew Jesus, right? And Paul is addressing in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 that you were dead because you never had the good news. You never had Jesus Christ. Does it make sense? That's one of the reasons in 2 verse 1 he says, you are dead in trespasses and sins. Yet walking or living as Satan's commanded them. Any idol worshippers or anybody for the matter is directly under the command or under the jurisdiction of whom? Satan. Not all. all okay, let me put it this way. Let's not, we, 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 we are not talking about People who doesn't know about Christ and they're worshipping idols, you know, you can't blame them because that's the way of life they have been able to live. But once you come to know about Christ and then worship idol, and then you have a problem. Does it make sense? Okay, let's move forward. It says now, and these guys were enslaved with all the idols without the gospel. And that's what he's talking about in well, chapter 2 verse 1 to the, one to 3. He says, uh, okay, you are, uh, you, you are walking or living under Satan's command then. Okay, and he says he was, they were enslaved to sin and Satan. They had no ability to free themselves. They were directly under the jurisdiction of science, Satan by worshipping Diana. And Paul goes a little further. They needed a rescue. They needed freedom. So God has done 
through his gracious action in Christ. And Paul celebrates two new blessings of God. Grace in the lives of believers and redemption and forgiveness. So what did the church of Ephesians need? They need what? Freedom from the bondage of sin. That is one part of the story. Why? Because they are under the bondage of whom? Satan. They need freedom. Freedom from what? Sin and bondage. I want to give an example. Okay, the children of Israel were where? In Egypt. They were there what? As bondage. Where? In Egypt. So what did the children of Israel wanted? Freedom. Relieving them from the bondage of sin. What about you and I need now? Relief from the bondage of sin. That's what Ephesians needed. Number two, they needed forgiveness. <laughs> Did Israel need forgiveness? Did they knew God before? Yes, they knew God before. But did they walk righteously before God knowing them? No. Did they rightly need forgiveness? Absolutely they needed forgiveness. But the principle of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is until and as you and I repent, there is no forgiveness. Okay, so what is Paul trying to reiterate with the church of Ephesians is you need freedom from bondage of sin and you need forgiveness. You know the Greek word which translates redemption in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 is uh, apodotrosis which means originally for buying a slave's freedom or paying to free a captive. That's what it means to say. That's a beautiful word. Like for example, you have become a slave. Just imagine in those days. Today there is nothing called a slavery. Of course we do have slavery here, there, and things like those days were, you know, what, 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 who is a slave? Who is a slave? A person who is absolutely subjugated to his master. Does he has any choice? No choice. Whatever the food they give, we have to eat. Okay. You can they can bark at him, they can beat him, they can kill him, they can do whatever it is. Does he have any freedom? No. Just imagine some way or the other. A person might be able to come and say, I'm going to buy this guy. <coughs> Most probably, the amount is so exuberant. In today's world, if they say that they want to buy a slave, giving him $100,000, just imagine. Is $100,000 a small amount? <laughs> it's a huge amount, right? Just imagine if somebody comes and gives that money and buys a slave. And tells the slave, I paid hundred thousand dollars. Now you are absolutely free to go and do whatever you want to. Will that happen? Usually. Will anybody come? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what the lavish gift that heaven bestowed upon you and me by giving Jesus Christ. A lavish gift. So that you and I could be able to be freed from the clutches of Satan. Generosity. He paid a price for sin and died on your behalf and my behalf so that only through him that we'll have an opportunity to know about. They're talking about God's grand Christ centered plan. That's the Sabbath school lesson that we are dealing with. And the topic that we're dealing on the Monday's portion is costly redemption. You know, it cost Jesus, but you have a lavish forgiveness. You know, our freedom comes at an extreme cost. That is Jesus Christ. We have redemption through his blood. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says. The idea of redemption also celebrates God's gracious generosity in paying the high price to our liberty. When you talk about this land, the United States of America, did the freedom come just so easily? How many people have died? 
Go on India, independence. It was not so easy to get independence, right? Okay, how many lives were taken before, before they could be able to get independence? You take every state, you take every country, in order to you know, celebrate the independence was not an easy job. And today, what's happening with Ukraine? They're fighting for that. Independence. How many people have been martyred? How many people have not martyred? How many people have been massacred in every angle in that war? So, freedom comes with sacrifice. <laughs> that makes sense? And Jesus paid the high price so that you and I could be liberated. And God gives us freedom and dignity. Is it true? What's the example that we can uh, cite from the Bible? God gave dignity and freedom. Do we have examples in the Bible? Yes, we do have a lot of examples. What about that lady who committed adultery? Mary Magdalene. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? When people were there about to throw stones and kill at her. What did Jesus say? Sin no more. Go, in. Go free. How many people casted a stone on Mary Magdalene? Nobody. Free. It came with a cost. What about the Samaritan woman who was there at the well? The woman at the well. The so-called as right? The woman at the well. You see, forgiveness and redemption are two important things. You know, the benefits of Calvary also includes the forgiveness of our trespasses. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. On the cross, Christ takes upon himself the price of our sin, both past and the future, concealing the record of debt that stood against us with the legal demands. In doing the work of redemption and forgiveness through Christ, God is acting as a generous father with the riches of his grace being lavished upon us. That's what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 talks about. Lavish. No human thoughts can be able to fathom. No human mind can be able to comprehend. You know, the very word which has been written in the book of Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, God with us. Can God become man? Can God become sinful? Of course, he never sinned. Hebrew says that he became sin for the sake of you and me. But just imagine, he left the whole heaven and came down and died for you. You know, God, God. He left his glory and been able to be a part. What a lavish gift for humanity just for the sake that you and I could be through him be saved. We are talking about heaven. In order to go to heaven, it is not so easy. The path was very difficult. He took the whole heaven to have Jesus to come down and die at the cross of Calvary. Expensive but we have lavish forgiveness. So how can you and I, when God has given all this for you and me to be saved and still reject Jesus Christ and be lost? <laughs> we get my point. You know, God has given everything he made way he gave Jesus. And still if you are lost, don't blame him. <laughs> it is by your own foolishness. But not accepting. God's grand Christ-centered plan. You know, always we read in the book of Galatians, when the fullness of time came, God sent his only begotten son, right? You know, Paul uses, you know, three labels for God's plan. Number one, the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will. Last week we did it. What is the mystery of his will? Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, and I always repeat this one. My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, right? Before the foundation of this earth, you know, Christ already, you know, the Lamb was already being said. Mystery, you and I can't be able to understand. What about the future? Can we know about the future? No, it is a mystery. So, what Paul is trying to say for the Ephesians is, number one, the mystery of his will. Nobody can be able to fathom, understand. Number two, he says, what about his purpose? Can we understand his purpose? The only thing that we can understand about his purpose is 
that he wants to take us to heaven through Jesus. That's all. Apart from that, you, you see, behind the scene, there's a lot of things which has been created. You and I can't be able to understand about this purpose. That is number two. Number three, a plan for the fullness of time. What is God's ultimate final plan for you and me? What do you think so? What is the final plan that he has for you and me? To unite everybody, everything, everywhere in Jesus. And that's one of the reason the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28, Go ye therefore where? To all, the all nations, every kindred, nation, and God. Ultimate plan of Jesus Christ. Does it make sense? What about the three angels' message? What does the first angel's message mean? Fear God. Fear God and give glory to Him. So the hour of judgment has come. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then? Worship the Creator. Worship the Creator. Worship who made? Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. And the waters. And the waters. Everybody God is calling. So that is the ultimate goal or the plan for humanity. You know, the term that Paul uses to describe the plan is a okay, picture stick. Okay, the Greek word called aneko phalontosithai, which means to head up or to sum up, which means all things in Christ. In ancient accounting practice, you would add up a column of figures and place the total on top. So Jesus heads God's final eschatological plan. This Christ-centered plan was crafted before the foundation of the world. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. He already planned before the foundation of this world about the plan of salvation. And it is so broad that it encompasses all time, that is the fullness of time, and space, all things, things in heaven and things on earth. You know, Paul's announcement is uh, unity in Christ is the grand and the divine goal of the universe. And do you and I believe that the whole universe is watching the drama which is happening here on this earth? We believe that, right? We believe that, right? The whole universe is watching as what is going to happen. They're looking for the climax. What is going to happen? The whole heaven, the whole universe is been witnessing for you and me, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So when we talk about the mystery of his will, his purpose, and the fullness of time, no humankind will be able to comprehend. Okay, so everything is rooted, his plan to unify all things is rooted in the death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Everything. And the exaltation. Uh, by founding the church and unifying disparate elements of humankind, Jews and Gentiles in it. In this way, the church signals to the evil past that God's plan is underway and the divine rule will end. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. As the Bible says everywhere, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is yeah. Where do you find this? Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. He knows his time is near. What does it mean? What does it mean to know that his time is near? What does it mean that devil knows that his time is near? He is home. God is going to put an end to his atrocity. That's what it means. So which means that you have been able to prevail till now, okay, for a limited time. You remember when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, the whole universe was awaiting for what? For what? Will devil be defeated or Christ be victorious? When Christ died on the cross of Calvary, devil was so happy. Does it make sense? He was so happy, right? Wow! I was so successful in what? Killing Jesus Christ. So I put a full stop in doing everything. What happened? Okay. With the first century, when devil worked, uh, okay, so, so uh, before going that, uh, and, 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 and what happened? When devil was so victorious in every angle, he thought that he was victorious. You know, the tomb also was being guarded by, he can never come back. 
devil. He can never come back. So we have God spreading for us, watching. Devil was victorious. But on the third day, when Jesus was resurrected, the whole heaven is watching. This is what God you know. The whole heaven is watching. And Jesus defeated whom? Satan. By the resurrection. And devil thought he is defeated in every hand. But still, he masterminded himself and said that, no, Jesus was not resurrected. His disciples came and took the body away. Does that make sense? Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you are watching for you, you are watching online. I want to urge each one of you, death's time is near, that's the way how he was defeated. We know that he will be defeated when Jesus comes the second time that his time is in. So that's one of the reasons devil is trying to work hard as possible to make sure that you and I will not be able, he's blocking the way for you and me to not go to heaven. So he's showing the chaos of this world and he's trying to make sure that no, heaven, don't worry about it. It's going to take a long time or you'll not be able to make it up. You're sinful and he's going to subjugate in every angle, put us down in every angle of life. But I'm telling you, God in his own infinite mercy has given this opportunity through Jesus Christ. God's grand Christ sent the plan is already being operated. Only thing is accept the plan and be able to move forward the way of the Lord wants. Make sense? Any question? So what should we do at the moment? The only thing that we can be able to do on this earth at the moment for the greatest gift God has bestowed upon you and me that is Jesus Christ is only praise God and worshiping him day in and day out. And repent. Repent. Be a part of it. Be victorious. Be able to live. So what Paul is trying to urge for the believers in Ephesians seems to have lost a clear sense of what they are as Christians to have lost their heart in line with what he had been affirmed earlier. So Paul wishes again to show up their identity as Christians. Believers are not the victim of haphazard, okay, haphazard, arbitrary decisions by various deities. No, you and I, which means Ephesians, they are the children of God and have access to many blessings through Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is trying to say. He's reaffirming them once again and says, whatever you are, you accept the gospel. I know sometimes uh, after accepting Jesus to be a personal savior, you might be able to go astray. But I would reinstate once again, the blessing is bestowed for you, for the children who could be able to be a part of Jesus Christ. So come back again, gain that blessing, enjoy, be a part of God's kingdom. That's what Paul is trying to reinstate for in the book of Ephesians 2 Ephesians. He says, praise God for his glory, he says. Have you ever received an inheritance as the result of someone else's death? Question. Hmm? Listen to this statement. Have you ever received an inheritance as the result of someone else's death? Grandparents died. Just imagine. Only after their death, you can be able to give <coughs> inheritance. Most probably five hundred thousand dollars. Or a huge plot to build a house, which you have not worked for. It was a gift. This is a gift. Why was it a gift? Because you were a child of the person who. Just imagine if I have $500,000 in my kitty, and who am I going to give? Your children. My children. I can't go and give to somebody else because they're not part of me. Why should I? Anybody. That's the principle, right? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Perhaps a relative left you a valuable treasure or a considerable sum of amount. In Paul's view, by virtue of the death of Jesus Christ, Christians have received an inheritance from God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful analogy. Beautiful analogy. 
not because you earned it. No. Don't have a mistake of saying that you can earn it. No. Because of somebody else's death, you could be able to be a part of that inheritance. What is an inheritance? Salvation. Eternal life. When I be able to see these things, I praise God for Jesus Christ. There is nothing that I own, nothing that I have. And that's one of the reasons the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Years have not heard. What the, the Lord has prepared for the children, those who love Him. That's the reason last week's sermon I was talking about until unless you and I have the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the reason I always told you we have to be good listeners. We have to be good listeners in every angle. And last but not the least, before we could wind up, we are talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, the down payment has been made. In exploring the importance of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, Paul uses two images or metaphors for the Spirit. The first picture, the Holy Spirit as a seal. God has sealed us through His Spirit. Consciousness. Does that make sense? In fact, today we are going to speak about emotions. Okay, so hope that we all will be blessed by that. Okay, the first picture of the Holy Spirit as a seal. I need to find the seal's presence of the Holy Spirit with others for the time of conversion. From the time that we have been converted, God has been able to give us an immeasurable amount of spirit, the conviction. In ancient times, seals were used for a wide variety of functions. The authenticity, copies of laws and agreement to validate the excellence or quality of the containers, contents, or to witness transactions. See, it was used for that, right? What about the Holy Spirit? How many times he would have convicted us? How many times he would have been able to be a part of us? This is right, this is wrong, this is not good, this you're not supposed to go. How many times we have been violated? And that's one of the reasons the greatest sin that can't be forgiven is what? Sinning against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. This, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I have been sealed by Holy Spirit. Yes, when a Paul praying, he says that the moment one gives his life to Jesus Christ and believes him, Holy Spirit seals you and me that the believer in Christ for the day of redemption, he says. Okay. The second image Paul uses for the Holy Spirit is that of guarantee. That means the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of an inheritance uh, which looks towards the moment when the inheritance is to be given in full. He'll be able to be a witness for you and me so that we can be able to inherit it, the eternal life. You see the whole plan of salvation? If you have to be God the Father, you have Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ has to be accepted in a personal Savior, God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we will be sealed for the day of redemption. You see the whole heaven, how it works on behalf of humanity so that you and I will not be lost. God has provided this plan of redemption was being able to be done before the foundation of this earth was being laid. We are talking about God's grand Christ-centered plan. The whole heaven is been able to gear up, been able to work upon, so that in John chapter 3, verse 16, as the Bible says, For God so what? Loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have one. God's grand Christ-centered plan. That's the reason Jesus said, until unless I go, I will not be able to spend, uh, send the comforter. comforter. He goes, the comfort. So we have constantly from the beginning, God is operating with a stubborn humanity so that he can save. What's God's plan? To save. To unite every kindred, every nation, every tongue. To be a 
part. And the last comes Christ centered plan that we can be able to see in the book of Ephesians. Any questions? Any questions? If there is nothing, may God bless each one, and as the Sabbath school offering will be collected. beautiful lesson. God bless each one as we place ourselves in the hands of Jesus Christ so that uh, uh, Jesus is successful, is victorious. Uh, our success and victory depends only on our relationship with Jesus Christ. May God bless each one. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Praise God in heaven. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify your name because of the grand gift of Father to Jesus Christ that you have planned and prepared so that we all should not perish but have eternal life. Give us an opportunity to enjoy that beautiful personal relationship as we are here on this earth. Experience your peace and happiness and move forward for the day when Jesus comes the second time that we all might be able to go home with you, to live with you forever. May that linger in heart, mind and soul day in and day out to the very last breath of our lives. And serve you, Father. As Jesus could be able to defeat the devil and be able to make it up to be a part with your father. Oh Father, sit at the right and give us an opportunity to inherit the kingdom, not by our own merits, but by the gift of Jesus Christ. And through him that we have an opportunity to be there with you. Thank you, Lord, for being with us and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, may God bless each one and uh, let's take a break for a few minutes and we'll be back again for the divine God bless. <laughs>